Well, hello, boys and girls. This is when we feel eight o'clock. I'm Pearl of Wisdom, and of course, you're listening to my NHL Pearls of Wisdom. And uh, I've been doing collab after collab after collab because I like it. And we get great people like this, Anthony Shirelli, Dally Tweets, my friend. <laughs> This guy is awesome. Uh, we've also we've done many collabs. I've actually did some podcasts with him about uh, the Philadelphia Blazers was what I did, but he's did a, he's doing a series right now on old teams that no longer exist anymore from all sports. It's pretty interesting stuff. But uh, I like to have him on as much as we can, and he uh, he 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 said that he was interested in talking some World Junior stuff, and also we're going to be talking about. Um, taxi squads and some of the interesting <laughs> things that are going, going to be going on. Uh, maybe some inventive ways the NHL is using with this problem with cap space and all that and taxi squad and stuff. But first, since you are from the U.S. and I'm from Canada, this is going to be an interesting <laughs> topic. Canada versus the U.S. and U.S. really just simply outplayed Canada. Uh, what what are your thoughts about uh, what were your thoughts before the game? Did you think the Americans were going to be able to play the way they did against the Canadians? Hard no. I thought it, I thought it was going to be a Canadian three nothing or three to one win. I just I, I love the way the Americans played in in pool play, but in the medal round they really they struggled with discipline. They were in the box a lot, and I just felt like the way Canada was playing on special teams and how they basically shut you down five on five. I didn't think, I didn't, I didn't think there would be any oxygen, so to speak for the, for the USA fire to, to breathe. I thought, I thought they'd be squelched right away, but they played a perfect game in that final. I mean, it, it, talk about knowing exactly what you need to do to win, get out and get a lead, basically take the oxygen away from the other team and, and just kind of, uh, I don't know how to explain it. Like, uh, squeeze them out like choke them out kind of in a in a metaphorical way it was uh it was just a, i, I kind of liken it to the way the st louis blues beat the boston bruins in game seven a perfectly played game got out to a lead defended that lead well uh, and, and in 2019 stanley cup finals way back when it feels like a decade ago yeah, so <laughs> uh but then i i just thought they played a, like you said a perfect game and and i'm i'm impressed they definitely defied my expectations and uh, even being uh, uh, from the united states yeah i that, yeah you're right i did say that they did play a perfect game and being here in canada um i heard a lot of ex, like excuses or you know canada didn't play their best game and stuff like that and i'm like no, no, we can't say nothing about that. That Americans, that I don't want to take any shine off of how the Americans played in that game. The, first of all, I went, before I said if the Americans were going to win, they were going to win with their speed. And they sure did that. They came right out, uh, put pressure on... on ...through Canada off, is the Americans showed no fear at all in this game going in their attitude and one of the reasons why that and is was another thing we wanted to talk about so we'll include it because he's on the team trevor zegers i mean before the game he actually said quoted saying i think we're bringing something that they haven't seen they haven't played against a team that can bring what we're going to bring today like he's like no fear whatsoever. He's he's calling them out, saying, "Yeah, you think, you think, you think," like ballsy. Oh, I loved it. How about you? I I agree. Um, I, I just in terms of what he brings to Team U, it was so incredible just to watch his leap from last year to this year. And they talk about tying. Uh, I think it was Parsons. <clears throat> no, Parsons is the goalie. Uh, Schroeder's uh, just I think his name is Justin Schroeder's record for most points in World Juniors appearance by a player from the United States. And so he had a good world junior in terms of points last year, I think racking up seven assists, but the confidence that he showed on team USA this year, willing to take those shots show that he, he, he can have a, his, his shot as a weapon. Uh, and I think that was generally the theme from a lot of team USA, just shoot from everywhere because turns out they have really <laughs> some guys who have some pretty wicked shots. So, uh, between Kyle Evans, Zegris and Caulfield. And so, uh, I just think that confidence that he showed from one year to the next, just just the experience of having two world or one world junior under his belt already, 
all of a sudden it was like he had the answers to the test and he just, he knew it. Uh, and that's a confidence that you like to see from a player and, and hopefully a future leader for uh, the Anaheim Ducks once he, once he gets there. Yeah, I also had Matthew Boldy. And, and this, these guys have been playing for quite some time. They were part, on the same team a lot. I think that was a big advantage for uh, the U.S. too, is they played for they played high school together, a lot of these guys and stuff like that. So the chemistry was maybe a little more to their advantage that I never took into account before the game. Even Spencer Knight uh, as well. The, the, a lot of them had them as his gold, their goaltender before, so they knew how to play in front of them. And uh, that, was a, that was a big advantage. But it's one thing to have those advantages, and it's another thing to use them to such an advantage as the Americans did. On paper, let's, Canada still had a, much, had a stronger team, for sure. But the team game was night and day. Like it was just night and day. They played as a unit better than the Canadians all around the ice. It was fantastic. So we want to talk about Zegers. Um, you are, it, it certainly means a lot to you being uh, an Anaheim Ducks writer. By the way, he is an Anaheim Ducks writer. You want to check out his stuff on Twitter there. That's how I found him. I was reading stuff on Twitter. Uh what do you, this? You you just mentioned something there about tre, um, Trevor improving so much since the last since he was drafted. Really, I remember when he was drafted. I thought, okay, this guy looks like he, you know he could possibly be a second line center. Uh, we'll we'll see. And he was drafted a little. I think he was eleventh or tenth or something like that. He was. I think drafted. he was nine. Nine. No. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I was like. It was a little bit off the board. There was a lot of people that had other people ahead of him and stuff like that. And then um, you watching him as he progressed, though. This guy, even his coach said, I just can't believe how much he's improved in such a short time, right? Yeah. I mean, just from they, they tell you he was here in, in Southern California practicing with the Ducks and working out, or I don't know, with the Ducks or with Ryan Getzlaff. He put on a lot of weight. He just... That jump in confidence that you saw. You mentioned the draft a couple of years ago. Uh, <clears throat> when when he was when he was drafted, there were some guys who I thought would personally thought would be better fits for the Ducks, but they were off the board by the time Zegers was drafted. So when it happened, I was just like, okay, I I don't see I don't see a problem with the, with picking that guy. But I was I was a little bit rich reading from what a lot of the draft experts were saying, thinking like, oh no, not another pass first guy. He he might be an incredible yeah. passer, but he can't. He he and I think I actually the 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 scouts were a good shot it was just being having the confidence to use it so i mean when he was drafted i thought they can't score already they have plenty of guys who can pass they need a scorer uh and he showed i mean he showed that he is both i mean he, he made his hands were incredible some of the passes he made were ridiculous his shots were spoke for themselves i mean i i went from being lukewarm about him just because i thought he was probably the best guy available when they picked him to being very i mean i think he's i think he's going to help them a lot right away I don't see how the Ducks don't put him, at least on the taxi squad, which we'll talk about later. But uh, he was just so good shot, his confidence, his his leadership ability that the Ducks will start to need soon as Getzlaff gets really towards the last couple of years of his career, presumably. And I, the Ducks don't really have a guy who is, at least to the outside world, who you really identify as a leader besides Getzlaff. I mean, there might be some guy... I, Silverberg and and uh, Hampus Lindholm and Cam Fowler, those are kind of the guys you think of who are who are the next in line. But there isn't that guy who you think like this is the this guy is charismatic. He is uh, a leader both by his words and by his actions. So uh, I really think that the Ducks have something excellent going on here, and and hopefully we're going to see him sooner, as in like next week rather than uh, next year. Yeah, it's hard to kind of put a finger on where how his game translates into the NHL. He is he could use some a little more weight on him and stuff like that. But he's certainly heading to the right trajectory. Yeah, um and we were talking not too long ago about our concern about Anaheim not having anybody in their system to be a first line center. Well well we I don't think we have to be concerned about that now. He he looks like a definite first line center. I've been trying to put a name like 
I, I don't mind doing this. A lot of people say, well, you know, you don't want to put a name or you don't want to put pressure. I don't think, first of all, Trevor Zegers, I don't think you can put more pressure on him than he are. You know, he's, he believes in himself more than anyone else could possibly probably put, believe in him for. Um, but uh, he kind of, he has the attitude of a stone and he has the ability of, um, I was maybe like a Nico Heischer. He reminds me of Nico Heischer in New Jersey at about the same age now. Uh, maybe Nico Heischer was was uh, a little more ahead of him as far as development is concerned. But he's gone so fast in his development that he's almost caught up. You know, he his growth is quite a bit. So Nico Heischer with the stone attitude, and I wanted to talk about that attitude a little bit. Um, about because it's something rare we don't see in players much anymore where a guy can come out and say you know we're not we're here to destroy them like right out in public i'm not making any excuses most of the players are like well you know canadians are a really good team and we're going to try hard to do our best okay. one this, game at a time pucks deep yeah. pucks to the net like the whole yeah, every yeah. time yeah, yeah, okay, sure, those are the cliches, but even the cliches now have become very passive, you know. You don't have the guys out there saying, oh, no, no, we're winning this game. You know, you don't get it. Yeah. We didn't come here to lose. We There's no Marc here... Messier's, or not as not nearly as many as there were. <laughs> That's right, yeah, and maybe not even saying calling that we're going to win the game, but going in and talking to Trevor Zegers, he doesn't give you any indication that they can lose the game. Like, he is saying, okay, maybe we're, we're going to be in here to destroy this team. Which brings me to the situation afterwards where they had the Canadian uh, logo, Canadian hockey logo yet, on a barrel. And uh, the story seems to be that uh, the barrel was a symbol for taking things one game at a time, something about a desert and filling up with water and, you know, only thinking to the point where that water is no longer, you're not using that water to get to the next place to get water and stuff like that. Cool idea, okay? But when it first came out, it looked like a trash can and they were saying, we trashed Canadian hockey. <laughs> And I hope that that is actually the case because honestly, I want that back in hockey again. You know, I, that was the way it was at one time, and nobody said boo about it. What do you think with that? Do you agree? With I that? agree with you there. I think uh, as a fan of of U.S. hockey, I think that it's it'll kind of usher in a new era because it did used to be like that, but the U.S. was also not even in the same universe as Canada was in terms of bringing up their young hockey players. Now that the teams are close, I mean, they're beating each other in, in, in world junior finals and they're, uh, the U S is really starting to catch up to Canada. Isn't exactly with Canada yet, I would say, but it's getting closer. I think that animosity is healthy. I think it, it breeds uh, competitiveness and, and more guys like Zegras that, that, want to show that they're the top dog that they have a chip on their shoulder so i have no problem with that it was not a i wasn't <laughs> like clutching my pearls and i don't i obviously i'm not from canada but i i wouldn't have been if i were a canadian uh i just think it's uh it's healthy it's fun there wasn't there wasn't any sort of there wasn't anything more offensive beyond 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 the connotation of what goes into the a garbage can like it was not it wasn't something like uh i'm trying to think of a good example but it wasn't something offensive it wasn't a it wasn't any sort of derogatory uh slur or anything towards towards the country or towards it just it was it was what it was and it was it was funny and i think uh i think if canada wants to do something like that next year a bigger garbage can or uh just <laughs> have the garbage can on their bench next to them while they play team usa that would be funny too yeah, that's what it's all about, and um, so we'll translate that. First of all, it's gonna. That, does Anaheim ever need something like that? The Anaheim Ducks, and uh, so it's gonna be awesome to have Trevor Zegers bring that attitude to them. But I would like to see it in the NHL altogether, and I agree with Tortorello when he says I don't like this tapping the other team's pads before the game and you know having little chats and stuff like like not before like on the ice before the game he doesn't care off the ice you guys want to hang out or whatever the case may be but when you get on the ice 
this is a competition. I want you to hate that team. You know what I mean? I want you, and I agree. I want to bring that back into hockey again. It's not um, in, in sport in general. That's what it's to me. That's what competition is all about. It's it's still fun. It's still enjoyable. And when it's over and you finish beating each other up, you still shake each other's hands. And to me, that's what the heart of hockey is all about, right? Yeah. I mean, and, and as fans too, it, both playing and as fans, you want, I mean, the hatred, I feel like hatred is not the right word, but the, the, the sports dislike or sports anger that one fan base has towards another is, is kind of what makes it fun to participate in as a fan. Like you want, you see a guy on the other team, you're like, man, I, I hate that guy. I hope someone gives him, a, <laughs> puts yeah. him over the boards or something like that. And it's, that's kind of the fun competitive part uh, yeah. watching them be buddy, buddy. And you, and you, a lot of the guys who retired within the last decade have said this, like anybody who listens to spit and chicklets has learned, heard biz talk about Paul Bissonette, talk about the whole buddy, no buddy, buddy before the game or no, um, what does he call it? Uh, something sticks, tummy sticks. It's like, it, 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 it's true. It does really take away from the fire of, of, of competition, I think. And I'd like to see that come back and, uh, even bringing up you you made a comparison to some of the guys you think Zegers looks like I, I remember I know they play different positions but Zegers is kind of quiet confidence and cockiness reminds me of Patrick Kane and on top of his hands his shot and uh all that so and Kane is a guy who who is the same way he, he did the heartbreaker thing when he was celebrating at that I think it was an overtime winning goal in the middle like spinning around on his knees in the middle of the ice or something like that like he that that type of thing I think has been frowned upon in hockey a little bit as it has been in sports like baseball, where you can't over celebrate and respect the game and that type of stuff. And it's like, no, bring that back. I want to see, I want to see extreme cocky celebrations. I want to see some, some anger and, and viciousness between two teams and two rivals. I mean, I'll admit watching international hockey over the last couple of years, I I've come to respect. I mean, I've always respected Canada in terms of their hockey ability and their, I mean, I would love to wake up in a country uh, on the eve of the Stanley Cup and have ESPN treat treat it like they treat the Super Bowl. Like I love that about Canada, but I, I want to feel that animosity towards their team again, like I did when I was younger and I was watching Team USA lose in 2002 to Canada and Salt Lake City and those mm-hmm. guys and just being frustrated, like, oh, we can't. Why can't we beat those? jerks and like it just i want that back now i see i i've got that respect but i want that that animosity back again yeah and you know i'm with you also i'm not i don't think everything is old school either i i think there's new progressive ways of, and i agree with you with this whole um you know not up staging the opposition because you're celebrating i think that's a bunch of crap sorry mr don cherry <laughs> carolina is not jerks it's fun it's fun all of this hate is fun hate we're not talking about literal gonna want to shoot you type hate or hurt you you know so you to end your career type hate i mean i'm a philadelphia flyers fan because of the way they played back in those days that was the kind of animosity they played with every single game like they were bitter on that ice man and um you know after the game was over had beer with anybody, you know, the opposition, all that kind of stuff like that. We're not talking about that kind of hate. We're talking about competitive, I want to win, you want to win, I hate the fact that you want to win, <laughs> I want to stop you from winning type game. And I also want to throw away, no, I don't. I want to throw away that part of the old uh, regime where celebrating is considered taboo and you can't you know if you're going to have an interview with somebody you can say some things that are on your mind and maybe show off a little bit or whatever the case may be i love it i think it's fantastic and it's wonderful for the game so yeah that's i i uh and i saw that in trevor zegris so that's what yeah. i wanted for i got ex- i get excited about trevor zegris kind of personalities that come up and go don't Freaking put this guy out, man. I want to hear that. I want to see more of that. On a tangent, I'm excited. I just this just hit my hit my brain. I'm excited if uh, if Zegers can make the team this year and, and uh, coming up, the rivalry that hopefully develops between he and Drew Doughty with the Kings. I mean, Doughty was just talking about how people don't respect oh, him. I'm yeah. sure a young guy like Zegers coming there, 
scoring, maybe dangling him, scoring a goal and celebrating right in his face is going to tick Doughty right off. And yeah. that's going to be a great, I mean, he's not a, Zegers isn't known as a physical agitator like Matthew Kachuk, but I, I think that that would get under Doughty's skin just the same. And I think that's, that's the type of animosity that, that we're talking about. I love Doughty for that reason too. He's, he's, he's the kind of guy I'm talking about. Takes mm-hmm. things personal. <laughs> he, he doesn't hide it. I love it. I love it. Love yeah. It, love it. Uh, yeah. So um, now taking on that. Okay. So we'll go. I want to see Trevor play right away. Trevor Zegers play right away. Also because Getzloff is kind of that guy too. He may be a quieter version of it, but Getzloff played mean. Man. He, he, when he was, when he, he doesn't back down from anybody. And I, and I think they want him, Trevor Zegers to play with Getzloff as much as they possibly can. I'm leaning to the possibility that he makes the team this year. They may play him in a guarded capacity, but just to get into the environment and see this, uh, and, and maybe even pour this out to their players right away, you know. But we talked about taxi squad, so I have not paid much attention to it. You brought it up to me, so I'm going to let you lead on this. What is the league doing with these taxi squads that you find so interesting? Yeah, well, basically the the taxi squad, if you haven't read about it, is is kind of a dual. Uh, at least temporary solve to not having minor league hockey and, and major junior playing right now as teams can get four to six extra players that can practice with the NHL team. They, they basically participate in NHL activities, but they're not on the active roster. Uh, you have to have one goalie on there. And basically as long as they're called up to the active roster before, I think it's 3 PM Eastern time on a game day, they can play. And meanwhile, when they're not on the active roster back on the taxi squad, they're considered basically in the minors. So it, it, it's a way to solve the issue of what happens if a bunch of players get a COVID or what happens if we have two, one or two injuries in a game and we can't, the, the risk of flying someone, or in this case, driving someone from San Diego to Anaheim, uh, increases our COVID exposure. It, it's, it's got kind of multiple purposes, but also, uh, as James Myrtle in The Athletic pointed out in a really brilliant article he just wrote, teams are going to use it for salary cap maneuvering and, <laughs> and maybe to an extreme degree. He was talking about, and I wrote an article about this for hockey writers just was published today about the way the Ducks could use it. Theoretically, since NHL teams carry usually 22, 23 players on the active roster and a standard on a standard uh, uh, without the pandemic and with minor league hockey and stuff, theoretically, a team could could carry 20 players, two goalies, 18 skaters, get under that salary cap and still have players easily available that they can call up at game time. So let's say you have a player with an entry level contract who's on the taxi squad. Uh, you're not going to get that cap hit on, except for when he's on the active roster. So days between games or uh, games where he would normally be scratched, he's on the taxi squad and all of a sudden you're saving this day's worth of, of payment. Uh, Myrtle used the example of the, of the Toronto Maple Leafs and it, to his math, if they do it correctly and, and every, if they did it aggressively and correctly, they could say, get something like, I forget it was $3 million of cap space or, or it was an extreme amount. And I think the ducks can do the same thing, which is what brings me to Zegris. You could put him on the taxi squad and it's kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, you get him practicing with the team. He doesn't necessarily have to play night in and night out. You can bring him up for for a, uh, for a game or two, send him back down, but he's getting that experience and that exposure around NHL players um, but then again, that is, like I said, if, if he doesn't force Murray to put him on the active roster, but, uh, the, the intriguing thing that I, that I saw mostly about the taxi squad before I give you an ice cream headache with all the math, no, is what no, they're going to do with, a, this is cool. well, what they're going to do with David Backus. I mean, the, the part of the rule for, for taxi squads in the NHL is since it's treated like the minors is that they go through the same waiver process. So an entry level contract players that are waiver exempt can be popped up and down until they get rid of that exemption. But Bacchus is not waiver exempt. He's got a one-way contract. He's an NHL player, but if they send him down to the taxi squad, they are still going to save money. I mean, they can, they can, I think save something like a little bit over a million dollars for the season. If they keep him on the taxi squad the whole time, which they won't. But the point is he's also, they're not worried about him. I would assume being taken on waivers because if he is all of a sudden that's his cap hit gone, he's not going to be a huge contributor to the ducks as far as I can tell. So I don't think a team's going to take him. So really what's the, what's, what's going to hurt about putting him down there. Uh, 
that's the interesting part of the taxi squad to me that that type of flexibility and once again credit to james myrtle for his for his very good explanation of that situation uh but just an interesting i think a uh, uh, silver lining that comes for ducks fans at least if you want to see young players uh play on the N- on the nhl at the nhl level versus what would be going on if there was an AHL where they're, where they're down there, the Ducks aren't afraid to keep them down there for a while. Now the NHL is really their only option uh, to develop some of these highly drafted young players, and, and they have a tool that they can help them do it. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, and again, like now a like guy like BX or not BX, what's his name? Bacchus. Uh, Bacchus, right. Before, you'd have to ship them off to the AHL, you'd have to go to whatever city and all that stuff like that. You don't want to disrespect veterans like that to, you know, and, and back and forth. But now it's just like, while you're there, it's, it's, it's just a, uh, basically a thought that you're down there. You're doing the exact same thing you were before. You end up losing a little bit of scratch, but at this case, I think he's just happy to make any NHL money. Uh, so he's not going to take it too hard. Um, it helps the team in the long run. And, what I like is like the Edmonton Oilers, for instance, got a guy like Cracknell, which probably will never play an NHL game. Uh, but if you're going to do something like you're saying with entry level contracts where you're saving money and the player can go in and out of the lineup, a guy like Cracknell will probably be a coach after he's all said and done. He, he, he made his living. There's a lot of guys that do that that just are great talkers in the room, almost like an extra coach on the roster to be able to get, they're able to speak to guys and get them going and uh, help them through times. Like they really care about uh, each individual player and are almost like psychologists on the team. Um, There's a guy in Calgary that I always forget his name. He's people always wonder how the heck does this guy always end up on a roster? And that's why he's like, he's like a guru of philosophy and uh, motivation and all that kind of stuff like that. And when he's on your roster, it changes the whole energy of your team. And uh, so that's a guy like Cracknell as well. He probably won't play, but he's going to be helping these kids have the right attitude and mind uh, frame to play the game and to grow as uh, humans and as players. So uh, that's it. That's an interesting concept. And but you're right. And Bacchus is, is 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 that guy. I mean, you've heard players talk about him that have played with him. That he is a stand up, a good leader. And I think if you're the Ducks, as long as he's not, uh, and you mentioned it's largely symbolic playing on the taxi squad for the player, except for losing a little bit of money. But like, if as long as he's got a good attitude, you couldn't have a better guy molding your young players like Bacchus on top of Getzlav. And and so I think that's uh that's going to be a benefit for the Ducks now. The one caveat I have with that is they're already in pandemic times. They're they're suffering financially like a lot of businesses are and and people are, and so they've already laid off a lot of their or furloughed a lot of their staff. I don't know if they have the stomach to pay uh, back a significant amount of money not to play because they're already paying Kessler a lot of money not to play and Corey Perry a lot of money to play in Montreal. So. Is that going to be a factor for ownership who actually cuts the checks? Uh, we'll see. The Samuel, I think, are pretty stand-up people. And, and uh, so uh, just not from any inside information, but just guessing that that might be the, the major sticking point when it comes to that whole Bacchus taxi squad theory. But I, I like, in general, what the taxi squad brings to hockey. I think it's an interesting wrinkle in these de- in times. Well, it's not just salary cap, it's actual dollars too, right? So they're going to be saving money in the long run. I'm sure they'll be happy with that. Uh, it is it is actual dollars for the player and for the owner. So, I mean, when you're taking a young guy like that, he's on his entry-level contract. He's kind of got to be like, why did it have to be on my entry-level contract now? Because you're going to lose however many. Like, they make about 850000 some of them. So you, they're going to lose like 150 g or 200000 but that doesn't sound like much, but for salary cap purposes, it can over, especially for each player as you're doing it, it can mean an awful lot. And you mentioned somebody like the Toronto Maple Leafs that are right up against the cap. That $3 million can bring in a player at the trade deadline or something of that nature. So very interesting stuff, my friend. And if you can believe it, we're almost at the end here already. <laughs> that, that did not by. seem like that did fly by. It always does. So anyways, I want to get a little more into your, uh, 
podcast there. Tell them all about it, what, what it's about, and uh, what's your next one going to be about if you have it figured out. Yeah, yet. absolutely. So our podcast, like we, we had you on and it was awesome. That, that episode is still one of our most popular. So <laughs> thank you very much for coming on talking about the wow. Philadelphia Blazers. Um, the podcast is basically about teams, professional sports franchises, mostly in North America, but I think we might do a couple from Europe soccer teams coming up uh, that have been that have disappeared, whether because they, they moved to another city really way early on in the, in their existence, or they just couldn't, couldn't function anymore, went out of business. Uh, but they changed in some ways, the landscape of professional sports and probably had some pretty funny stories or interesting stories come along with them. Uh, our most recent episode, I believe was episode eight. I talked about the, uh, local team here, the Anaheim Amigos of the American Basketball League, which were, if you, if you know about them in the ABA, it feels like they were the inspiration or part of the inspiration for that Will Ferrell movie, Semi-Pro. They were really, uh, it's just a disaster for the most part, even when they were good. Um, and my buddy, Andrew, uh, he covered the Colorado Silver Bullets, which was the first, or not first, but uh, an all-female professional baseball team since the, the, league, uh, the league back in the, around the war, the World War II. So um, that's what we were doing the most recent episode. Coming up, I think I'm going to cover another hockey team, the Montreal Wanderers, of uh, pre-NHL times, a Stanley Cup winner. So, wow. uh, yeah, that's going to be interesting because I, I just read <laughs> – it got really deep into the history of the Stanley Cup more so than I have in the past. And I was like, this is incredible. So I'm excited. <laughs> cool. Well, I'll be listening to it. I hope you guys all check it out because uh, I had I had fun doing the one we did. And uh, I, I'm hoping somewhere down the road you, you could make this into like uh, a maybe mini documentaries, which is kind of what it is. That's why you should really listen to it because it's like a mini documentary. And it's not just about the sport it's about the stories so it's fascinating to see some of the things and, and the way the owners did things and how it all worked out it was great well Absolutely. boys and girls that's our full 42 percent i hope you enjoyed this fine programming i certainly did i loved having you on delhi head over to delhi tweets right on mm -hmm. uh, on, on and anything else you want to tell them there bud uh, no, I got a, uh, got the, that article for hockey writers focusing on the ducks taxi squad, like we just talked about and, and the podcast, which I, oh, uh, and I'm on, um, totally offsides, which is another ducks podcast. Right. I'm kind of one of the rotating co-hosts, uh, which came out this past week and we covered, yeah, start the start of training camp and, um, world junior. So tune into all of those. If you have the time, I'd love it. And give me some feedback. Steelflyers.com, all sports. You guys know all about that. It's going to be amazing. Have a great day, everybody. Lots of love to you.